Well, good afternoon and happy hump day to everybody. My name is Brian Kane, publisher of Exconomy. And as you know, Exconomy focuses on engaging life science leaders and innovators at the intersection of science and technology. Our mission via our daily newsletter, Accelerating Life Science Events and Award Programs is to connect the funding and the partnerships, the technologies and the science, all necessary to support and enhance the successful development of novel therapeutics. Today, I'm happy to welcome you and over 230 of your colleagues to today's presentation, Next Generation Drug Discovery, Leveraging E3 Legacies for Targeted Protein Degradation, brought to you by Exconomy and presented by Eurofins Discovery. Today, we're gonna to discuss how E3 Legacies have emerged as pivotal targets for drug discovery. And using the promising new paradigm of targeted protein, protein degradation, there are, there are actually hundreds of diverse E3 legacies with differentiated tissue expressions. This new paradigm may well define a, the next dimension of precision medicine defined by an axis of tissue-specific activity. So needless to say, this is going to be an exciting presentation, which we hope will generate a lot of questions and a lot of, rich, a lot of interaction from you folks. But before we begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First of all, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please press the help button on your player console to receive assistance in solving common issues. We certainly welcome your questions during today's event. So in order to submit your questions to today's presenter, simply type in your question into the question window at the left-hand side of your screen and hit the submit button. We'll be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A session and we'll allow the main presentation that will follow the main presentation, but we'll also feel free to send in your questions at any point in time, and we'll add them to the queue as we get them. If at any time you're having audio difficulties or having trouble advancing the slides, simply hit your F5 to refresh your webcast console. And also, be, please be aware that today's sessions are being recorded and will be available on, on Exconomy's website, exconomy.com, beginning tomorrow for you to review and you'll be notified by email when the archive is available. So without further delay, I'm happy to introduce today's presenter. Senia cohen Katsunelson is the R&D leader, group leader at Eurofins Discovery. Senia, it's all yours. Hello and welcome to our webinar. My name is Ksenia cohen Katsunelson, and I'm the group leader of San Diego R&D team with Eurofins Discovery. Today, I will tell you about our newly launched platform, the E3 Scan, that measures ligand binding and its application in targeted protein degradation and protect discovery. The agenda for today will start with introduction about targeted protein degradation, and then a short overview of Eurofins Discovery services for targeted protein degradation. Then I will dive into the E3 Scan technology and proof of concept. After that, I will talk more about other biochemical assays that we offer for uh, targeted protein degradation to complement the E3 scan platform. And I will end up with our screening capabilities and how the E3 scan can be utilized for these purposes. And at the end, we will have a Q&A session. So I want to explain where the idea for the E3 scan platform came from and why. I'm sure some of you are familiar by now with the story of thalidomide, but I wanted to still mention and, ex and explain how important that finding is. Thalidomide was first marketed in 1957 in West Germany under the trade name Contergan. It was primarily prescribed to treat nausea and morning sickness in pregnant women. However, shortly after the drug was solved, between 5,000 and 7,000 infants were born with focomilia, which is malformation of the limbs. Only 40% of these children survived. Throughout the world, there were about 10,000 cases that were reported with focomilia due to use of thalidomide. And finally, in 1959, thalidomide ceased to be provided over the counter. Only by the end of 1961, it was completely taken off the market due to massive pressure from the press and the public. In 2006, thalidomide made a comeback as a combination drug for the treatment of multiple myeloma. 
This was thanks to a work from Celgene and other companies. And st still, during that time, the precise mechanism of action for thalidomide was not known, even with over 2,000 research publications on it. Only in 2012, studies started to emerge showing that thalidomide's target is the Israeligus cerebellum. And now it is well accepted that thalidomide is repurposing the specificity of the Israeligus cerebellum to its target proteins. These findings and others led us now to a very popular approach in drug discovery. Can we make more drugs like thalidomide that will retarget the specificity of an Israeligus to a target of interest and degrade it? The potential of this approach is huge. This means we can now target previously thought undruggable proteins such as transcription factors, scaffold proteins, and other non-enzymatic proteins. There are two ways we can uh, approach the targeted protein degradation. One is we can use a molecule called PROTAC, proteolysis targeting chimera, for a specific targeting of an Israeligus to a target of choice. The product technology was first described back in 2001 by Kathleen Sakamoto, Greg Cruz, and Ray Deshais. It is a chimeric protein or a molecule comprising of a ligand for an e ligus connected through a linker to a ligand for a target of choice. This can bring together the e ligus and the target protein to close proximity, enabling ubiquitination of the target protein by that e ligus and eventually degradation of the target protein by the proteasome. We can also use a molecular glue type of compound that exactly like the name suggests, glues together an e ligus and a non-native target protein to close proximity. In this case, the outcome is the same. The target protein is marked for degradation by the proteasome. Targeted protein degradation holds a great promise as compared to small molecule drugs. I'm gonna mention a few of the benefits uh, of this. Undruggable protein, such as transcription factors, scaffold proteins, and non-enzymatic proteins, cannot be targeted for development of a small molecule drug because this needs to be inhibiting their function. But they can be targeted for protein degradation using a product or molecular glue. Also, small molecule drug works by binding to the active site of a target whereas degraders don't need to, they can bind to another site on the target protein. In addition, degraders can be tissue specific by choosing an e ligus that is specifically expressed in a certain tissue. This is much harder to achieve as a small molecule drug. Degraders can be designed with substoichiometric potency for their targets, which is very difficult to achieve as a small molecule drug. Small molecule drug can lead to drug resistance and compensatory feedback activation, whereas degraders are less likely to do so. In addition, degraders are uh, very specific and are less likely to have off-target effects compared to small molecules that are known to have off-target effects. Eurofins Discovery offers a variety of assays and products for targeted protein degradation drug discovery space. To detect binding to an e ligus, we have the e scan that I will tell you more about shortly. To detect binding to a target protein or a disease protein, we offer the Kinom scan, Bromo scan, and BCL2 scan. And I will mention these as well later. In addition, we also offer cell-based assays and phenotypic platforms. This is to assess target degradation and target engagement. And we also have the chemistry beyond the rule of five. If you're interested in any of these other additional services, please reach out to me and I will connect you with the appropriate experts. So I will talk now about the E3 scan ligand binding assays. Due to the high demand in the drug discovery field for a platform that can screen across the e ligus family, we applied a kinomscan 
technology to develop a substrate recruitment side directed competition binding assays for diverse ESRI legacies. Humans have an estimated 600 ESRI legacies for which we would like to develop assays. We have done so in the past for kinases, bromo domain proteins, and BCL2 family proteins. The assay principle is ascribed here. The E3 scan is very similar to the kind of scan technology and has three key components in the assay. You can see in panel A, the first component is an E3 ligase that has a DNA tag on it and is expressed using our proprietary mammalian or phage display expression systems. This is not a purified protein, but a protein extract, which makes it very easy and fast to make and scalable. The second component in the assay is an e ligase ligand that is immobilized on a solid support bead. And the third component is either a test compound or a control solvent. So the three components are incubated together for one hour, after which the beads are washed and elution is performed for 30 minutes. The elution is then used for an ultra-sensitive qPCR readout. So in panel A, in the absence of a test compound, the e ligase binds to its ligand on the beads, the wells are washed and eluded, and its signal is detected through a qPCR readout. So in this case, the e ligase will be eluded in the assay and the signal will be high. In panel B, in the presence of a test compound that can bind to the e ligase and compete it off the beads, there will be no E3 ligase eluded in the assay, and the qPCR signal will be low. In panel C, if the test compound does not compete the E3 ligase of the beads, the E3 ligase will again be eluded in the assay, and the qPCR signal will be high, just like in panel A. So we are looking for a loss of signal in this assay. To produce e 3 ligases for the e 3 scan technology, we use two methods. In both methods, the human e 3 ligases are labeled using a qPCR amplicon for signal detection. They are then expressed using two systems. One is the T7 phage display system. In this system, the e 3 ligase is cloned into the T7 phage genome and displayed on the phage code. The qPCR amplicon is cloned into the phage genome as well. The other system is mammalian HEC293 cells. In this system, the E3 ligase is N terminally fused to the DNA binding domain of NF kappa B and transiently expressed in 293 HEC cells. The qPCR detection amplicon that binds to the NF kappa B domain is added to the reaction. As a proof of concept, we developed E3 scan assays against several well-studied E3 ligases that I will present to you now. Here are shown assays against MDM2 and MDMX. MDM2 is a very well-studied E3 ligase that is known to degrade the tumor suppressor P53. MDMX, on the other hand, does not known to exhibit an E3 ligase activity of its own. However, we chose to develop assays for the, both of them because MDM2 can form a complex with MDMX that transforms it to become a more potent E3 ligase. Also, MDM2 is considered to be a simple E3 ligase in a way that it does not need another partner protein to be active. So we cloned full lengths MDM2 and MDMX and expressed them using our proprietary expression system. Here you can see data for the control inhibitors. For MDM2, idazanutlin and nutlin 3 a give comparable KDs to literature values measured by HDRF and SPR techniques. And nutlin 3 b acts as a negative control, just as expected. For MDMX, we used peptides to build and test the assay based on literature studies of this protein. You can see that both assays are robust with window of more than 50-fold. 
Additional validation of these assays was possible thanks to a collaboration with Ileron Therapeutics. And here you can see both MDM2 and MDMX assays against three different stapled peptides. The stapled peptides bind to both MDM2 and MDMX, but with different affinities, and the potent KDs can be detected using our assays. Specifically for the stapled peptide ATSP7041, this was published in the literature before, and you can see that the binding affinity detected in our assays is comparable to the one reported in the literature using the BIACOR technique. Here is shown an assay for VHL, which is considered a complex E3 ligase. It requires other partner protein in a complex to be active as an E3 ligase. For this assay, we have cloned the full-length VHL fused to its partner proteins along in B and C. And this is based on this crystal structure published. We validated the assay against non-positive and negative control inhibitors, and the KD values that we obtained match the ones that were obtained using fluorescence polarization and ITC techniques. The assay window for the positive control inhibitor VH298 is very robust, more than 800 fold. And we have also additional validation from other compounds that unfortunately I can't disclose here. Here is shown an assay for another complex E3 ligase, Cerebron, the one that I mentioned in my introduction. For this E3 ligase, we made two versions of the assay. One is full-length cerebellon, and the other one is full-length cerebellon co-expressed with its partner protein, full-length CDB1. We validated both versions of the assay against uh, three control inhibitors, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, and thalidomide. Between the three inhibitors, we got accurate rank order of KDs. However, the KDs measured in our assays are more potent than the KDs reported in the literature using fluorescence polarization assay. Our explanation for this is that our assays do not reach the tight binding limit. We use picomolar concentrations of our e 3 ligases in the assay, which allows us to measure much more potent KDs than other techniques can do. In addition, we measured binding affinities of uh, commercially available products and their matching negative controls in both versions of our assay. As you can see in the table here, there was no significant difference in the measured KDs between the assay of Cerebellon alone or the assay of Cerebellon co-expressed with DDB1. In addition, we did not observe a difference in the assay signal. So both versions of this assay are commercially available. Here are shown assays against three beer domain E3 ligases, CIF1, CIF2, and XIF. These E3 ligases are considered simple E3 ligases, and each of them has three conserved beer domains that can bind to different proteins, which are targets of ubiquitination. We have developed assay against the full-length version of each of these proteins. And we are also in the process of developing assays against the individual beer domains of each of these targets. Each of these assays was validated against four known inhibitors, and the measured KDs for each of them is summarized in this table here. Also are shown a couple of representative curves for each of these E3 ligases. You can see that the assays are robust with a 40-fold window for CIF1 and CIF2 and a 300-fold window for XIF. And in addition, we see a rank order of binding to the control inhibitors as seen in the literature. So in summary, we have developed commercially available E3 scan assays against seven E3 ligase targets. All the assays are robust, high throughput, and give high quality KD curves. The assays demonstrate correct potency and rank order for the control inhibitors that were tested. The assays do not approach the tight binding limit and can detect picomolar binding of compounds and peptides. 
As you can see from the two family trees of a simple and complex E3 legacies, we have around 600 members. So we have more assays in development right now that are not offered through the commercial portfolio for other E3 legacies. And for our assay development, we do need a ligand, but we are not limited to a known small molecule ligand. We have used peptides as ligand for other assay development in the past using this technology, and we are developing now additional targets using this approach. I would like to emphasize the advantages of the E3Scan platform. First of all, quality of data. As you could see from the proof of concept, the assays are accurate, precise, and reproducible. They have a broad sensitivity and dynamic range and show good reference compounds data. All the assays are run in par parallel on a single platform and there is no compound interference in the assay. The second advantage is the quantity. These assays are high throughput and run in 384 well plates. So they are suitable for library profiling. The third advantage is we can do custom assay development. And I will touch about this process later when I get to the screening capabilities part. Last advantage is the speed. The turnaround time for weekly submission is less than 10 days. And for bigger screening campaigns such as libraries is 20 days. And this is true for all our Kinom scan based technology assays. So the E3 scan is good for measuring binding to an E3 ligase. But if we want to measure binding to a target protein, the other side of the warhead, we can use other biochemical assays that use the same technology. Those are the Kinom scan, Bromo scan, and BCL2 scan. So as I mentioned before, these assays use the same technology. And for kinome scan assays, we have 489 kinase assays, and those include clinically relevant mutants. For bromo domain uh, proteins, we have 40 assays that uh, cover about 60% of the entire family. For a BCL2 scan, we have five assays towards all five family members. Similar to the E3 scan, we offer custom assay development. Um, for additional targets that are currently not in the commercial portfolio. And all of these assays can measure ligand potency and selectivity by screening to the entire platform. For these assays, we can measure ligand binding mode and as well as kinetics. And all of these assays are suitable for library screen as well. I would like now to explain more about our general screening capabilities at European Discovery and how they can be applied for the E3 scan and other Kinom scan assays. Our screening capacity for the E3 scan and other Kinom scan binding assays is more than 134 well plates per day. To support this screening capacity, we have some key equipment in the lab. And this includes two echoacoustic dispensers uh, adjusted with uh, plate sealers, some additional plate sealers for qPCR plates. We have a barcode labeler with robotics, multiple combi dispensers and VPREP instruments for liquid handling in 384 well plates. And we have multiple ABI QS7 qPCR instruments with robotics. Another new instrument we have is the nanotemper high throughput microscale thermophoresis, which can measure additional biophysical interactions. And we hope to implement this into our services by early next year. I would like to also mention that we have highly skilled staff with experience in assay development and screening. We have access to all of European's discovery products, and the assays are performed by scientists who invented and developed the assay technology and are deeply experienced with it. This flow chart demonstrating how a typical E3 scan would look like for a custom assay development project followed by a screening campaign. So in case the screening is done on a pre-existing assay, we can actually, we don't need the first three steps. 
but in case uh, custom asset development is necessary, we start with cloning of the target and synthesis of a mobilized affinity ligand. After that, establishment of proof of concept and then optimization of assay conditions. These three steps could take about six to eight weeks, depending on the target and the ligand. After that, an HDS is performed. This could be either with a customer's library or one of our libraries that I will mention later. And we can screen between 50 to 500,000 compounds. The hits are followed up for confirmation and determination of potency by running full dose response curves. This whole process takes about two to three weeks, depending again on the size of the library. In case a customer is interested in one of our libraries, the slide summarizes the ones that we have access to right now. So we have a diversity library. We have it in a focused format with 50,000 compounds and a more expanded format of 300,000 compounds. In addition, we have a fragment library of 1,366 compounds. And we have additional library strategies such as group work with ChemDive and Anamen, as well as virtual library design and screening through Xerocet. So in summary, Eurofin's Discovery's protein degradation portfolio includes a comprehensive suit of target-based cellular and phenotypic approaches for a powerful drug discovery resource in this emerging space. Identify and characterize new potent and selective ligands that bind and reprogram E3 ligase substrate specificity using our new E3 scan ligand binding assay platform. Develop, characterize, and validate the warhead end of novel products using our KinomScan, BromoScan, and BCL2 ligand binding assays. These three scan assays are robust, high throughput, they do not approach the tight binding limit, and we can support an HDS screening campaign from start to finish. I would like to finish by mentioning that Eurofins Discovery is part of Eurofins Scientific, which is a leading international group of laboratories providing a range of analytical testing services to pharma, biotech, food, environment, and consumer product industries and governments. We have almost 50,000 employees located in more than 800 labs in more than 45 different countries. So with that, thank you so much for attending our webinar. Please stay for the Q&A session, or if you would like to learn more, you can visit our website or contact me directly through the email provided here. Thank you very much. Tania, thank you very much. That's a very comprehensive presentation. You, you certainly covered a lot of information and broke it down very, very effectively. Uh, we do have a number of questions um, from the audience that has been that have been submitted. Um, so, for the audience out there, while Senia is is answering your questions, please take a moment to check out the resource links uh, for additional information uh, and a link for actually uh, Eurofin's upcoming webinar uh, a little later on uh, in the year here. But uh, Senia, um, the first question that we have is: Do the KD values match using other technologies? Thanks, Brian. Um, so, as I mentioned uh, in one of the slides describing the cerebellum assay, uh, we did have a couple, most of the KDs measured in our assays do match the literature values, but we did observe a couple of instances as, for example, for cerebellum assay, where the three control inhibitors uh, that we measured in our assay were about uh, tenfold more potent, and the reason for that is in our assays we use very low concentrations of the E3 ligases, and that allows us to measure a much wider dynamic range of KDs in our assay, so we could measure uh, up to picomolar KDs, and therefore we think that in using other techniques, sometimes you need to use much higher concentration of your target protein to get enough signal, and you are limited by uh, how potent of KD you could measure 
and we think this is why uh, we could measure lower KDs in some of the assays. Perfect. Great. Thank you uh, very much. Um, next question. Do your CBRN and VHL assays express uh, DDB1 and Alongin B and C? Yeah, so for VHL, uh, we used a construct where we fused the full-length VHL to its partner proteins, alongins B and C, uh, based on the crystal structure um, to kind of assess whether having the partner proteins in there would affect the assay. Um, although we did not observe a difference in KDs, we did observe a difference in the assay signal, and therefore we decided to uh, offer commercially the version of VHL that is fused to Longings B and C. For Cerebron, we developed this in two different versions. One is Cerebron full length uh, expressed alone, or Cerebron expressed with the partner protein DDB1. And uh, we, as you saw the numbers, we compared the KDs of these two assays side by side against a variety of uh, uh, positive control inhibitors as well as Protax that are available. And we did not observe a significant difference in KDs for those, but we do offer both assays as commercially available right now. Great, perfect. And, and here's here's a, actually a, an interesting question. Um, well, they're all interesting, but this is uh, I'm ready for the answer on this, that uh, many of the E3 uh, legacies are known to be notoriously difficult to, to express. So uh, how do you, as, um, as a company, deal with uh, these difficult uh, E3 legacies? Um, that's a good question. So actually, mm. the big advantage of our uh, technique or technology is that we don't use purified proteins which that's what makes some of these proteins are very difficult to express and have stability issues. Instead, we use uh, an expression system, like I mentioned, either mammalian cells or the phage display system. And using either of these systems, we have not observed so far any difficulties with protein expression, not for e 3 ligases and not for any of the other targets. So I, I think having uh, the advantage of using mammalian system especially makes it much easier and a high chance to get a good expression of your target protein. Um, another approach we sometimes undertake is we clone a variety of constructs to see which one will behave be better in our assay. So we clone a full length, and we also clone different domains or um, different lengths of domains to just see which one will behave better um, and maybe fold better in our assay. So that's also uh, an approach that we undertake to good, get a good expression of the target protein. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. And then just kind of a flash forward or, or a quick look ahead here. Will Will your discovery um, be developing uh, any assays that aren't currently in your menu and terms? Um, yeah, so definitely we are taking uh, CADs, custom assay development projects, and we 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 even be happy to do so just to you know get more assays to our portfolio. So as I mentioned before, we are not limited by having a small molecule inhibitor for uh, an H3 ligase. So we could develop a bait for the assay using a peptide. So if there is a known binding sequence or uh, a similar conserved sequence, we can build a peptide library or a variety of peptides to find the best bait for our assay and develop the assay using that technique. Um, as I mentioned before, for a custom assay development project, uh, we estimate between six to eight weeks to developing uh, a, f a final optimized assay. So yeah, if, you, if you, um, anyone is hmm. interested in those, just feel free to reach out to me with more questions about that. 
And that goes for uh, the audience in general. Um, as we run through these these next few questions, if we don't get to your question, um, uh, Senia and and the folks over there at Eurofins will be very happy to uh, get back to you directly uh, and kind of work with you uh, offline here a little bit. But we do have another question, Senia. Is um, uh, do you provide expression plasmids for for E3 uh, legacies uh, or stable HEC 293 cell lines, uh, which express specific E3 legacy? Um, unfortunately, we do not because in order to express the E3 legacies, we have a proprietary expression system. So all mm -hmm. of these services are done in house. Okay. But if someone is interested to know um, the construct boundaries, the amino acids that we use in the assay, all of these are available on the website when you go to choose the catalog number or the assay that you would like to use. Gotcha. Um, do, do, you, um, do you think that the E3 legacies display well uh, on phage? And, uh, and what, uh, what if uh, post-translational modifications are required? Uh, do you switch to the to the hex system at that point? Yeah, so uh, yes, they will display well on phage. The only limitation with phage, you would need you probably will not be able to use a full length protein, uh, a sh but a shorter construct that will include the E3 ligase domain and uh, certain boundaries around it will be totally fine to express in phage, and we have done so. And uh, what else we could do? We could build constructs in parallel for the two different systems and test them in parallel uh, in our assay and see if there is any difference in their behavior in the assay. And again, we have done so in the past to choose the best assay conditions uh, for final assay. Great, great, Sonia. Well, I, I tell you what, everybody, we are sensitive to the time and know that everybody is busy, and we certainly appreciate everybody taking time out of their, their day to listen uh, and kind of interact uh, with Sonia's presentation. If you do have any outstanding questions or follow-up questions um, following this presentation, um, and if we didn't get to your question uh, for some reason, uh, Sonia, the Eurofins Discovery team will be more than happy to get back to you uh, directly. So. Uh, on behalf of Eurofins Discoveries uh, and Exconomy, uh, thank you very much for attending uh, this webcast. Uh, we hope that you have a productive remainder of the day. Please take care and please stay safe. Have a great afternoon. Bye now.